Hi, I'm Dr. Alex Canseco. I'm a mom, a vet, and a creative. And if you're new to my channel, I do post one video every week on Thursdays at 8.30. And my video content is centered around, well, you may have guessed already, my three areas of interest, motherhood, veterinary medicine, as well as art and design. Every month I also do post videos on things to do in San Diego with kids because this is where I live and I want to share that with you. Um, this month I will be posting extra videos on this topic and maybe even through next month because it is summer and there is so much to do here. So I thought I'd take the opportunity this time of year to do that, to get out more. If you like my videos, please hit the like button, subscribe, click the bell button also for notifications on when my next video is coming out. In this video today, I'll be giving you tips on how to best introduce kids to pets and I'll be focusing on dogs and cats specifically. So let's jump straight into it. If you're able, uh, do prepare ahead of time before introducing children to dogs and cats. If possible, even you know years ahead of time, if you know you're planning on having a baby in the future and you've got a new puppy, this is the time to train them, to expose them to, to children, to different um, situations so that they're comfortable when it comes time. And the key areas that you want to focus on are obedience training, desensitization, as well as doing a mock routine. So if your dog doesn't already have behavior training, I recommend getting this done at least four to six months before baby's arrival. Cats can be a little bit harder to train, uh, but they are trainable. So complete any behavior training before your baby arrives. That is the key. For example, a group class, so that the dog has exposure to other animals, maybe even other people. Socialization is key. The more you socialize your pet, the better. They'll be less scared, they'll be more comfortable in new situations. And if you can, introduce your pets to children when they themselves are still young, less likely that the child will get hurt. And this is the critical period in development when animals learn best and take in the most information when they are themselves young. So the first, you know, three to four months of age even. If you have friends that have kids, you can ask them to visit. The more exposure that your pet gets to children, the better. So if your pets already do like children, you can invite kids over so they can play with your, with your pets, throw toys, have them make the dog sit, give them treats, make it a positive experience, as positive as possible. This is my dog Lucan with my niece about nine years ago. Take note of his body language. He is alert in this situation. He is checking things out. In this particular photo, he does have a relaxed body posture. His ears are perked up but not facing forward. His mouth is slightly open. This dog is relaxed and reasonably content. Such a dog is unconcerned and unthreatened by any activities going on in his immediate environment and is therefore approachable. When he was a puppy and we'd go for walks and I'd see children on the street who wanted to come up to him, I would always encourage it, but I would make sure that the children did not pet him until he sat down quietly and calmly and then I would allow the children to pet him. Understanding animal body language is key when introducing pets to kids. So here are some examples of things that you need to be aware of. Don't lean over a dog and don't stick your hands in their face. Rather crouch down to the level of the animal and approach them side on. This is a lot less intimidating. 
also take note of this dog's body language. He's got his tail tucked between his legs, his ears pulled back, his eyes wide open. He is terrified. A scared cat will also pull its ears back and they may even swoosh their tail, looking like they're wagging it. As they become more frightened, they may even hiss. And dogs may growl. These are all important signs to stay away from the animal. Don't pat a dog on top of their head, they don't like it. There are also other places where you shouldn't touch dogs and certain places that they enjoy being touched. A safe bet is usually petting them on their chest or under their neck. But you should definitely avoid touching the legs and the tail. Cats normally prefer their heads being touched as well as the base of the tail. They definitely hate their belly being touched and their legs. So do not even attempt to approach those parts of the body. Don't stare an animal straight in the eyes. It's extremely confrontational. And definitely don't shout and squeal. This is all easier said than done, especially when it comes to children. They don't know what's okay and what isn't okay. So we as parents and guardians have to teach them. So in terms of behavior training, there are some important things that you need to concentrate on. You wanna create off limit zones uh, and you can do this. So first of all, for training, sit and stay, that sort of thing. So you can avoid the pet entering the area that you don't want them to enter but also actually creating barriers around certain areas can be helpful. That is important for both the pet and the child. You want to create areas that are safe zones for both baby as well as for your pet so they can get away from each other if need be. With cats, what you can do if you want them to stay off certain pieces of furniture is you can use sheets of cardboard and you can put a double-sided tape on the on the surface of the cardboard and place that onto anywhere that you don't want the cat to jump and when the cat jumps on there they don't like that stickiness they will avoid that area in the future and it may take a month or, or so to get them to learn so like I said planning is key you can have for example a little cat door for the cat to be able to escape from the baby when they need to into a safe room or a crate that the animal can enter and you know teaching children to stay away from that crate teaching pets they can go there to feel safe as well so feeding the animal in that crate making it a safe zone so the other important thing is teaching them to stay off furniture or only jumping on furniture when invited for example the bed the couch you know especially larger dogs uh, if you're holding a tiny little baby, you don't want them to be jumping onto you or jumping onto the couch when uninvited. So in terms of leash walking without pulling, um, so definitely taking them to training classes can be helpful in doing that. But also some important bits of hardware that can be helpful, a front attaching harness or a halty, a head collar as well can be helpful in preventing dogs from pulling. And this is important, especially when you're taking baby for a walk on a stroller or you've got them uh, in a carrier. You don't want your dog to be pulling you down the road, you falling over, having the stroller flip over. It can get pretty dangerous. So desensitization training essentially means training your pet to become accustomed to typically negative stimuli um, so that they're not stressed out by it. And the idea is that you expose them uh, to this negative stimuli gradually, you know, start, start with mild stimulus and, some, and have it get worse, and I'll explain that in a minute, while rewarding them, giving them attention, giving them treats, depends on what the motivating factor is for that individual pet. Some, some pets are food driven, others are driven by play. You wanna desensitize your dog to sound, especially that high pitched baby scream. 
and you can play crying baby noises. Start with really low volume baby cries. Make sure your dog is tolerating that. Gradually increase the intensity over a few days. The sessions should be five to 10 minutes long while giving your pet treats and attention to reward calm behavior. Now, the important thing is when you turn off the baby sounds, you wanna ignore your pet because you only wanna be giving them that positive attention when those sounds are on so that they can associate them with a positive experience. Hopefully they'll look forward to them when the baby arrives. Other thing you wanna desensitize your pets to is smell. So babies smell different. We start, we're gonna use different products, different skincare products. So those are all new smells that are gonna come into the home. There's gonna be baby poo. Um, Etc. So you can start applying some of those baby lotions, you know, weeks ahead of time to get your dog used to that. But also you can bring an article of clothing home later on when baby's born ahead of you bringing the baby back to the house so that the dog or cat is exposed to that smell also. Once baby starts, gets a little bit older, they will be very curious about your pet. They will poke them, prod them, pull them, etc. So getting your dog and cat used to poking and prodding. How do we do this? Do frequent handling ex exercises, anywhere from four to eight times a day, where you give especially desirable treats, for example, cheese, chicken, whatever it is that your dog or cat likes best. You want to save those treats for this type of training. And once again, training sessions should be short. So when you start your training, be very gentle. You know, maybe just a gentle pull of the hair, um, a little poke here and there, touching them in places that they're not used to being touched. And for example, you know, around the mouth, the nose, the paws, the tail getting them used to all those areas being touched. And this is a good idea when you get a new puppy anyway, so that they're used to going to the vet, being touched there also. But especially when children arrive, they're gonna to be touching them in all sorts of places. Obviously, I don't want you hurting your animals. I don't want you to be doing anything too rough, anything that will actually hurt them. Even a pet that's conditioned not to react to these sorts of things can bite. So you have to be very careful that and make sure that you're supervising your baby and your pet at all times. Even if you've trained them, that is no guarantee that they will not turn around and bite or scratch your child, especially if they become very painful or if they're ill or they themselves are hurting. Also children who are tired or frustrated can accelerate their roughness to the point where a very tolerant pet can react. The other thing you might want to do is get your pet used to seeing humans move in a different way. So especially in terms of crawling. So you might want to crawl around. So that isn't intimidating for them. Get the stroller out, get out pieces of equipment that you will be using when baby arrives and have your pet get used to being around those pieces of equipment. And once again, reward them when they are calm and don't seem to be stressed out by the presence of those items. And so a mock routine can be quite helpful. So having a toy baby, doing a diaper change, carrying the baby around, sitting with the baby while having your pet next to you, all those sorts of things will help your pet become accustomed to this new routine but you want to wait till a little bit closer to baby's arrival maybe one to two months before you start actually alternating your pet's routine so feeding time etc so about one to two months before baby's arrival you want to you want to try and decrease the amount of attention your pet receives uh, and a lot of, a lot of people want to actually give their pet more attention because they know baby's going to be coming they feel they feel bad for you, for their pets, so they wanna smother them with love. But that can be counterproductive because then your pet's going to be expecting that attention. It's actually gonna be harder for them to adjust once the baby comes. So you wanna decrease the amount of attention. You wanna change up the routine because inevitably once baby comes, things are gonna be all over the place, believe me. The other thing you wanna think about is maybe hiring a dog walker because you are not gonna have as much time 
maybe until baby gets a little bit older to get out there and get walking. So in terms of changing up the routine, you can, you can start to feed your dog at you know, more sporadic times of the day. So maybe you fed them at 9 a.m. and 9 p.m. at night. Well, now maybe you'll feed them at 7 a.m. in the morning or 11 o'clock in the morning instead and kind of change that up a little bit. And same goes for the evening. You may want to change a little bit. It's a little bit harder if your pet is on medications that they have to get at a regular time, but you can still give that medication, you know, with a little bit of food um, and then give them their full dinner or breakfast later on. Or, or split up the meals a little bit more, maybe give them smaller meals three times a day, you know, and once again, change that up so it does vary, so your pet isn't so um, shocked when baby arrives and things like that happen. Pets are creatures of habit, so they do really like routine, but inevitably, like I said, routines are not gonna be routine anymore once the baby arrives. Now for cats, the other thing I would consider is potentially moving their litter box, especially if it's in a location that the baby can easily get to once they're on the move. And you don't wanna do this when the baby starts moving around. You wanna do this ahead of time before baby comes so it's not a shock to your pet. So you wanna do this gradually. So first of all, I think it's important to have a couple of litter boxes as you're doing the move. You always wanna have more than one litter box, especially if you have more than one cat anyway it'll always be one extra litter box per number of cats. So if you have one cat, it's a good idea to have a couple of litter boxes. If you have two cats, having three litter boxes. If you have four cats, having five litter boxes, etc. So you want to gradually move the litter box to a location where your child is not going to be ac able to access later on. You want to move them, you know, a couple of inches maybe per day until it gets to that location that you want it to be in. And that may take a while depending on how far you're moving it. But having that extra litter box can be helpful as well so your pet can have a choice of where to go. Speaking of litter boxes, um, on the flip side, if you have a diaper pail that isn't securely uh, closable, make sure you get one because if you have a large dog or even a cat, who is curious, and a lot of them are, especially about new smells and poo, they may get, get into that diaper pail. So make sure it's either out of reach for your pet, or it is one of those very secure diaper pails, for example, the diaper genie, where your pet can't get into it. So we've done all the training, we think we're ready to introduce the baby. Well, not yet. There are some other things we need to think about. So making sure that your pet is uh, healthy, parasite free, very important because there are some diseases and parasites that can be spread to your baby. So for example, leptospirosis, rabies, toxoplasmosis, just to name a few. There are vaccines to protect your pet against some of these diseases. So talk to your vet about that. Also check out my videos on things to avoid during pregnancy. I will post a link up above or you can visit my channel where I do cover toxoplasmosis. So finally, the big introduction, what do we need to do? First of all, I recommend that you as a family have settled into your home. Uh, you've got your own personal routine um, sorted out as much as possible and you're ready for your, your pet to come home. We're actually lucky enough to have Lucan stay at my in-laws house for about a week after Owen's arrival. So that was nice um, because we could settle in, get everything sorted with Owen before we brought Lucan home for the big introduction. First thing you should do before bringing your pet into the house, uh, if you have done what we did, is to take them on a long walk, get them tired, make sure they're in a calm state of mind. So after a couple of days of baby's arrival at home, you can let your dog or cat sniff the baby. It's best to have them on leash, a loose, short leash, so you have some control. And then you wanna praise and give the dog attention when they're being calm. And once they're calm, you can take them off the leash. I would wait maybe till the second or third 
interaction before doing that. Maybe on the first interaction, just keep them on the leash. It's a little bit different with cats, obviously. The thing you can do with cats and sit down with your baby on a couch. You can have another member of the family hold the cat and you can just sort of sit next to each other, cat and baby. If your cat doesn't like to be held, then sort of just sit with the baby, let the cat approach, you know, give the cat treats, pet the cat um, if they're being calm. Don't force the baby onto the cat. Don't force the baby onto the dog. Let them come to you. Let them investigate. Let it be on their terms. It is very important to have your dog on a leash, even if you have no reason to believe that your dog will show any aggression towards the baby. You just never know. It is a completely new situation, especially if you're a first time parent. And it's a good idea to also distract the, do the dog with plenty of treats and attention while you're introducing them to the baby. Make it a positive experience, as positive as possible. So they associate that positive experience with the presence of the child. And praise your dog for any calm interest in the baby. To avoid scolding your dog, you wanna try and avoid any negative feedback for your dogs because you want to associate your baby with good things. The other thing you might wanna consider is having pet appeasing pheromones in the home. You can get diffusers. For cats, you can get feel away. For dogs, you can get adaptor. They also come as collars and sprays. So you have a perfectly trained dog and cat. They love your baby. And now your baby starts crawling. Oh my goodness. And they're grabbing your dog and pulling at your dog. It's okay, you've done that desensitization training. So hopefully they're somewhat accustomed to it. But nonetheless, you have to be careful and you have to now train the baby. So just as important as it is to train your pets to be gentle around your baby, it's important to train your baby to be gentle towards your pets. It's important that even though we've done desensitization training for our pets, um, we still are supervising the interactions and we pull the baby out of the situation or pull the pet out of the situation that, that is becoming very negative for either party. And it's important to create those safe zones that we talked about earlier in the video. Um, and it's important to teach our children to respect our pets' bodies, their safe zones and their belongings, so their toys. Pets can be very attractive to kids. And once a baby is mobile um, and a bit older, they, they will most likely start to grab and pull at your pets. It's important to teach them to be gentle. So gentle petting. So you wanna demonstrate how to interact with your pet. If you're busy doing things around the house and you're not able to supervise your child and your pets together, it is best to separate them. So either putting your pet in a different room or um, blocking them off into a safe zone or, or in a crate or having your baby in a playpen, for example, or once again, blocking a room off or blocking a space off so that they are separated. Now it is especially important to keep children away from your pets during feeding time. Some animals can be very food aggressive. Sometimes your pet can snatch at food and this may not be coming from aggression, but just be an accident, just may just be a natural reaction or, or reflex, um, but it can still hurt your child. So just a good idea in general to keep children away from pets when they're eating. Also, don't leave bowls of food down, either your children's food or your pet's food, um, so that there is no altercation between the two of them um, in getting to that food. Now, pets can also be toy aggressive, especially if your child is trying to play with the toy when they're playing with their toy. Flip side, your pet may wanna play with your kid's toys, may not wanna have your, your pet chewing on your children's toys. And this is where the drop it command comes, comes into play. Not only is it best to avoid your pet putting baby toys in their mouths due to bacterial contamination, plus or minus parasite transmission, but they may ingest the toys that can cause a blockage, especially smaller toys. So you may wanna create a gated area or once again, block an area off with the children's toys or the dog toys to prevent any issues from occurring. The thing you can do to keep your dog's toys interesting for them, 
but also to keep your children's toys interesting to them too so that they're not playing with each other's toys is to rotate those toys around on a weekly basis. Explain that hitting, kicking or pinching dogs and cats as well as riding, teasing and intentionally scaring them are not okay. It's a good idea to teach your child to play structured games with your pets. So for, for example, throwing a ball, playing hide and seek, training games, trick training and clicker training. Those can be just as fun for your dog as they are for your baby. And teaches them positive interactions. The bottom line, you guys, is always supervise your children with your pets. Never leave them alone together. As friendly as your pets might be, they may and will act out when they're very painful or very scared. If your dog is actively avoiding your child or is showing signs of fear or aggression, towards your baby, please completely separate them immediately and contact a certified professional to help you with training. Make sure that that professional is qualified to help you. So there are certain certifications, credentials that you will be looking for. And here they are. I do have links below this video if you want more information about any of the topics I have covered. As I mentioned earlier on, this month I will be doing more videos on things to do in San Diego with kids. And next week we are going to go to Oceanside Beach. There are many beautiful beaches here in San Diego, California, but one of our favorites is Oceanside. So do check out that video. We'll see you then. Bye.